welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, we are getting walloped by a blizzard, so in case the house collapses under the weight of the snow, I figured I'd get the episode out early. I have, um, I've had kind of a rough time the past week. The, uh, the artistic inspiration I was grooving on in last week's intro didn't carry me as far as I, I hoped it would. Or, to be more accurate, I didn't do the work to fulfill that inspiration and, uh, and kind of keep building on it. But I did, uh, I did stand in my backyard on Saturday in the cold and draw the three trees I wanted to draw. It's like my, my Ernie Bushmiller and his three rocks. I, um, unlike Ernie Bushmiller was disgusted with myself after finishing that, even though I knew it was the first time I'd ever tried to draw anything. And, you know, I know I'm not going to be perfect. I know I'm not going to be any good. I know I don't have any technical chops whatsoever. But one of my pals, um, he asked me about that today, and I, I sent him a picture of the drawing as well as a, a shot of the, the three trees in the backyard. And he said it was good, and, and he's an artist. And, and when I looked at it, I realized, you know, actually it wasn't that bad, you know? I mean, you know, not realistic, just just two lines capturing the outlines of the tree grow, going up and, and all these branches and stuff. But but it did kind of capture the the wizened, gnarly limbs and branches. So uh, so maybe I ought to keep at it. Still, the the cold and the, the dark and the, the lack of running while I try to fix whatever's wrong with my legs, all that plus a lot of work at the day job last week really translated into a not so happy gill you could say depressed gill but you know i'm uh i don't know it's a new week i recorded two shows over the weekend i have hours of show snow uh, snow shoveling ahead of me tomorrow and lots of great books to read and and guests to get ready for and my schedule lightens up a little bit and uh, i guess maybe things aren't so bad now yeah, thanks for cheering me up Anyway, let's get to this week's show. Uh, my guest this time is Nadia Owusu, author of the new memoir, Aftershocks, from Simon & Schuster. Um, Aftershocks is a, a neat book in in which Nadia kind of ties together all these, these disparate strands of a really fascinating life. And it, it well, she's got the, the, the fractured family of her abandonment by her birth mom when she was two and travels through Africa and Europe with her father and his role at the UN and then his untimely death when she was 13 and her stepmother kind of continuing the 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 explorations they they undertook and and um and it all sort of revolves around issues of race and identity her her birth mother was Armenian American and we'll say white, and her father was Ghanaian, a uh, descendant of Ashanti royalty, and therefore black. And, well, she just, she sort of explores all these these different fragments of lives that she's led, and the places that she's called home, and and the experiences she's had living in New York from 18 onwards. And the, and sort of the the personal and cultural myths that sustained her, but also ultimately almost destroyed her. Um, and, and how you kind of reframe those stories and reclaim, you know, your, your life in the process. Anyway, it's, it's a neat book and the mosaic nature of aftershocks kind of really helps evoke the, uh, the shatteredness of contemporary life, that the way we exist in terms of how we're seen by others and and the things that we remember, the things that stick out from our lives. Most of mine are shameful episodes of my childhood, so I, I tend not to reflect on them too much. But but we also figure out, you know, not only how we're seen by others, but how we see ourselves. 
in the process of the book, Nadia explores the the places she's lived and the the shifting nature of race and and whether reinvention is possible, which I, I bring up in our conversation because ultimately she chose to live in New York, which is which is where people go to to become new. Also, and it is part of the conversation. The the book sort of centers on the time in her her late twenties that Nadia had a major depressive episode and parked herself for a week in a blue chair that she dragged up from the sidewalk. I'm only telling you that because it all leads to my final question in the conversation. Anyway, here's Nadia's bio. Nadia Owusu is a Brooklyn-based writer and urban planner. She is the recipient of a 2019 Whiting Award. Her lyric essay, So Devilish a Fire, won the Atlas Review Chapbook Contest. Her writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the New York Times, The Washington Post's The Lily, Literary Review, Electric Literature, Epiphany, and Catapult. Aftershocks is her first book. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Nadia Owusu. First, uh, double congratulations uh, on the book and on getting hitched. You're 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 my back to back guests who got married during the pandemic. Uh-huh. So uh, congratulations on that. In addition to to aftershocks. Thank you so much. But first, I guess, when did you feel you were ready to write this book? Um. Well, so the book kind of started as as something that I was just writing for myself. Um, just sort of making sense of my life and trying to understand, you know, the places where my family came from and my experiences. And so I was doing a lot of sort of writing by hand in notebooks. And then at the same time, also doing a lot of research, you know, because I grew up outside of my parents' cultures. My father was Ghanaian and my mother is Armenian American, but because my dad worked for the UN, I moved around a lot. And at a certain point in my life, um, I felt like I really wanted to come to know, you know, my family's history and the history of the places where they came from. And then to better understand sort of my experiences within those cultures, outside of those cultures. So I was really just doing it for myself. Um, and and then I kind of set that aside for a couple of years um, and was writing something else. I was working on a novel and then kind of went back to that material at some point and just felt like that was more urgent. Like I really wanted to tell that story, you know, once I'd gone a little bit of distance from it. And so then the question was, can I take this raw material and make art out of it? So in some ways, you know, I had done a lot of the work before I even knew that it was going to be, or that I wanted to turn it into a book. Mm -hmm. And did you have um, sort of memoir influences either in that initial process or once you began kind of recrafting it into to what Aftershocks became? Um, I didn't I didn't read a lot of memoirs um, previously. I'd read some memoirs and loved them, but I, I read mostly novels. Um, that was sort of what my uh, my sort of reading practice was for much of my life. But I did start reading a lot of essay collections. Um, you know, uh, Aftershocks is, is tr- sort of uh, essayistic in form. Sure. It's a memoir, but um, each kind of chapter has its own sort of um, curiosity that it's following. Um, There are threads kind of linking them. But yeah, I read essay collections, everything from sort of Joan Didion, Lydia Yaknovich's memoir, which I think is also kind of essayistic in form. Um, I read the collected schizophrenias. Yeah, so once I started realizing that that's what I was writing, I began reading much more broadly. And and I actually do read a lot more kind of nonfiction now. Hmm. And how did you change over the course of the book, over the course of, of writing and, and subsequently publishing the book? Um, so I know you're, you're capturing something from 10 years ago plus, but yeah, that's sort of what I wonder in terms of, you know, what the process itself did for you. Yeah. I mean, I think because I started writing the book as a project that was really about a personal reckoning, um, it was really about kind of coming to know my place in the world, understand my identity in different ways, sort of reclaim stories that I had been given that didn't serve me. And so 
in some ways, the writing of the book was intentionally a process for me to explore myself and and learn and grow. And that's sort of how I approached it. Um, and then I guess when I went back and sort of decided that I was going to um, see if I could turn it into a book, um, at that point, you know, I was around 30 and I was having different experiences out in the world, you know, like further along in my career and sort of reckoning with like, how do I bring this process that I have gone through for myself? You know, I work in social justice. And so in some ways I was thinking about um, how do I bring this process that I've kind of embarked on for myself to deeply reckon with and understand history into the work that I'm doing in the social justice space, where I think it's equally important that we have a sense of history and, you know, how policies came to be, um, how people came to live in community in the ways that they do, so that that can sort of uh, open up new possibilities. And so that's sort of what I was thinking about a lot as I was, um, you know, taking that raw material of the book and turning it into art. Mm -hmm. And final chapter of the book, notwithstanding, what what's home to you? Um, so because my my father worked for the UN and I moved around so much, you know, for much of my life life, I've, you know, wanted to belong. And just as we were settling into a country, you know, I was learning the language, making friends, then we had to get ready to leave. Um, and, you know, we lived everywhere from Italy to England, Ethiopia, Uganda. I was born in Tanzania, you know, my father being Ghanaian, my, my mother being Armenian American. And so I often felt like I was kind of an outsider, even in my own families and, you know, living in a place, but, you know, knowing that it was going to be temporary, um, and so that that has been a big part of who I am. And in some really wonderful ways, you know, I feel like I can um, easily sort of settle anywhere. And um, I'm very open to people and places wherever I am. And I always made a huge effort to kind of get to know the culture and the language. That was really important to my father. Um, and so that's sort of how I was raised. And so, you know, that had, that was a really lovely part of my upbringing. On the other hand, you know, there was always this sense of like, do I have a place to call home the way that other people do? And I think over the years, and especially, you know, you asked sort of how I've changed through the writing of the book, I think one of the biggest messages that I took away from the exploration that I was doing in writing this book was that I do get to define home and family really expansively. And so I don't see home as a single place. Um, it's all of the people and places that I've, uh, you know, lived among and loved and tried to belong to. And that, you know, through my love for them, I claim them not in uncomplicated ways, like I have a complicated relationship with all of them. But but my love for them does make them mine in a way. Um, so that's, that's, I think, one of the, the like biggest lessons that that I took away from writing this book. Do you wish there was a sort of central place uh, i would say the navel even knowing how that um occurs within the the book also that that um follows that that central place for you as a person i don't i mean i i used to i don't know that that's even what i was long, longing for as a child necessarily because I, because of how i grew up i don't think i could imagine just having one place um and especially because my family is all over the world and so that that is very difficult for me to imagine. I think what I was longing longing for was more just like a feeling of deep connection, um, probably to many of the places that I wanted to belong to. So it's my my longing for home still doesn't sort of um it's not centered in a particular place, but now I see it as kind of um like an active thing where I'm working towards deeper connection to all of the people and places in my life and you know, and, and claiming many homes. And I, I've fully embraced that idea at this point. Cool. One of the things I found fascinating now, I'm uh, as an openly white man, I, I have to say, um, <laughs> the <laughs> thank you, just because of your, your openly black statement you, you made on, on Twitter a while yeah. ago, um, what you had to learn about being black in America I guess versus you know England and and Tanzania and Ghana and and other places you've lived, uh, you know, it, it just struck me. I live in northern New Jersey. I've lived in the same place for fifty years, pretty much. And when you cited the Eleanor Bumpers story, 
to me, it was like something that occurred when I was 13 or 14. I remember reading in the papers and how terrible it was and, and all. And thinking of somebody coming to something like that later, not having the whole framework of America and being black in America and, and what that all means. Um, I guess that, that greater question, you know, what, what did you have to learn or, or what do you feel you're continually learning about this country in particular and, and our racial issues? I guess we'll just put that in air quotes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been American my, my whole life because my mother um, was, a, was an American, is an American yeah. citizen. <laughs> um, and so although I was born in Tanzania, you know, if you have one American parent, then you um, are can automatically be a U.S. citizen. And so I, I did grow up knowing that in some senses I am American and, you know, although my mother left when I was two, so I didn't have a deep connection to, um, to America. I would visit her, you know, here and there when I was growing up, um, for summers, you know, spend some time in Massachusetts. Um, but at the same time, you know, America is kind of experienced everywhere around the world. And, you know, I sound American, this, this voice that I'm speaking in now, <laughs> I sort of developed when I was um, kind of nine or 10 and I started going to um, American international schools. Before that, I went to British international schools, So I had a British accent. Um, but, you know, because I sounded American and because I have an American passport, you know, I didn't come here as like an international student, but I did arrive when I was 18, not having lived here um, for most of my life. And I think a big part of my coming of age was coming to understand this, as you were saying, kind of the racial arrangement in America and as a black woman. I've also been black my whole life. Um, so also trying to understand my place in America and within that arrangement. And that was a big part of, of you know, my coming of age and settling in this country. It was really quickly clear to me that that race and racism kind of shape everything in American life. And I think that it was so clear to me because I was coming to it as an outsider who was not assumed to be an outsider. Um, people sort of assumed because of how I sound, sound that I grew up here. And so that was sort of how, how people approach, you know, came to me. And so, you know, I was, I was very quickly noticing the way that all of our systems, whether that's sort of where people get to live, even in a city like New York, there's a huge amount of segregation, you know, where people go to school that, that a lot of that is shaped by, you know, our racist history and racist thinking, and that even when we got rid of those laws on the books, that that thinking continued to be very central to the American experience and the Black American experience. And I don't think that I fully understood that before I came here, um, because you know we got some American history in the schools that I went to, but when we learned about the civil rights movement, it was sort of like you know the civil rights movement happened, and then you know there's still some racism, but a huge amount of progress has been made. And, uh, you know, actually, as a black person, you're better off in America than you are anywhere else. And, you know, I think that that's complicated. It's true and not true for many reasons, you know, because colonialism and anti-blackness are also global phenomenons. But I don't think that I expected that I would just be able to see that disparity just in walking around. Um, yeah. And also the way some white people reacted to me was very different from what I was used to, as were their expectations of me. So, you know, anything from like professors acting surprised or kind of extravagantly enthusiastic when I did well in class. Um, and then when my younger brother moved here, it became even more jarring because, you know, for me as a black woman who's small, you know, I'm a petite person. I, I don't think that, you know, people found me particularly white people found me particularly threatening in the same way that they did my brother. So it was an even more challenging experience for him to come here and find himself, you know, during the height of stop and frisk in New York, constantly harassed by the police and having some violent encounters. And so all of that was very much an education, um, an education for me. Yeah. And that's, that's what I was sort of wondering what, it, what that experience is like, or whether there was a, a moment that was just, yeah, this is not what I thought America was supposed to be, you know, once you were immersed in this place and, and you know, experiencing what it's like. 
Yeah, I don't think it was so much a moment as just like a growing awareness um, mm -hmm. that, you know, it really was in everything. And I think that that's why I do the work that I do working in social justice um, in U.S. cities and racial justice in particular. Um, and I think that it was just like this, this like growing sense of unease about sort of um my place in this country and how people saw me and, you know, a real reckoning with who I thought I was, you know, in other places and like what opportunities would be available to me? Should I feel safe in certain environments? There were, there were just always these accumulating questions and um, yeah, I would say like a growing sense of unease. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I've been here now all of my adult life, really, you know, I moved here when I was 18. And so, I do see America as home and there are many things that I love about America. And I often think of, you know, James Baldwin saying that because he loves this country so much, he feels strongly that he has to critique it um, in order to kind of imagine that, that other possibilities, better possibilities are, are open in the future. And do you, it's one of the interesting things in the book, and it, it actually harkens to another show I did a few years ago with a, a writer named Emily Rabiteau about the, the definition of being black, depending on where you are in the world, you know, to, she was a very light skinned, uh, uh, black writer. And when she was on this sort of identity quest, you know, discovers in Jamaica, she's considered white and in other countries, depending on what the cultural context is. She's either black, white, or something else. And that sense you also bring up in, in I think in Ghana, you, you mentioned that it's, you're not exactly black, black there. And you're also kept out of the sun at one point by a relative who doesn't want you darkening and in, in, while you're sitting out reading. So yeah, it's that, that, that shifting of identity I, I found really fascinating within the book, not only how you are, but how you're seen depending on the, the the framework in which you're you're living in any given moment. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, because anti-blackness is um, sort of a global phenomenon and sort of baked into the way that the world works and the way capitalist systems work um, and the way we think about um, you know the history of of Europe and Africa and you know tied up with colonialism and slavery and all of those forces are connected. And so um, I think that it's it's you know more and more people these days are are coming to the to the understanding that race is a specious concept that it's a social construct and so it does change and shift and move depending on where you are and i think for someone like me who's moved around so much and moves in and out of different cultures there is just an awareness that the way that I'm perceived often has very little to do with how I might understand myself and has much more to do with the history of that place um, and the, the way that race is constructed and arranged in that place. And, you know, I think colorism is something that exists not just in the black community, but in Asian communities as well, where the closer to white that you are, um, then sort of that's considered better. And, you know, that that sort of um, belief system uh, came with colonization and, you know, the oppression of, of people. Often uh, the colonial powers would favor, you know, for example, in Africa, tribes that that uh, had more European features like that was the root cause of the Rwandan genocide, for example. Um, and so working to understand, you know, why those forces exist has also been part of, you know, my coming of age. So when I lived in Ethiopia, people would often think that I was Ethiopian. But then in Ethiopia, a lot of Ethiopians don't actually see themselves as black, they see themselves as a completely different race. And so sometimes in Ethiopia, I wasn't black, but my father who is Ghanaian, and darker skinned than me was black, but I, you know, definitely did see myself as black. So um, yeah, it sort of depended on where I was. Um, and then kind of the incident that you're talking about in Ghana, you know, there is colorism that exists in Ghana too. And a lot of people sort of bleach their skins in order to appear lighter skinned. And so people would often make comments about, oh, you're so lucky that you're, you're lighter skinned. You have to stay out of the sun. You don't want to be as black as I am. You know, those kinds of comments that, um, that just remind us that, you know, we have a long way to go um, 
in our understanding of, of how racism continues to play out in people's day-to-day -day lives. And you, I mean, I don't mean to, to put it lightly, you get it coming and going. Uh, even your, your birth mother, who's uh, Armenian American, carries this purge genocide, uh, you know, with her, which wasn't exactly skin color based, but still you're a different religion, you're a different ethnic group. We're going to purge your, your population too. Um, so yeah, you, you, you bring up that notion of, you know, trauma being carried in the genes, uh, mm -hmm. both in terms of, you know, that, that epigenetic expression of it, but also what lies underneath, uh, generationally as, as events like that occur. It's, uh, like I say, it, it, it's kind of fascinating. I come from, I'm first generation American. So, um, lots of bad Eastern European history mm -hmm. uh, in our family. Um, but again, there's there's only one side of it, I guess, in terms of, you know, it's solely because we were Jews mm -hmm. with whatever other reasons, you know, conflate with that. But um, but it does raise that question. And and knowing that the book is sort of centered around a particular a particular crisis moment that you you had the sense of of kind of living in crisis mode constantly versus finding a way to live at peace with yourself. Did you feel that sense in the, either in the course of composing the book or, or in the years subsequently that, you know, that sense of, of crisis can kind of abate? Yeah. I mean, I think that there was a way in which um, without noticing, I was sort of accumulating, there's this concept called weathering where your, your body is sort of, um, processing trauma even when you're not realizing it and it kind of wears down the body and can have health impacts and I think that for a lot of my life for so many reasons you know my mother leaving but then as you're saying that was sort of had its roots in in sort of more ancient traumas that that my mother's family um, went through escaping the Ottoman Empire you know as refugees um, because of religious persecution um, and genocide and sort of finding their way eventually to America and having to start over and, you know, and doing some research around epigenetic inheritance and how that sort of shows up in people that can already exacerbate that sort of fight or flight response, um, which, you know, is a, is a natural response and something that we need to survive. But in some people, um, it's very difficult to turn off. And so, you know, understanding sort of how that inheritance sort of played out in my life and showed up in my life. And then, you know, I did live through a lot of other um, kind of traumas that were more immediate in my life, you know, from my father dying when I was 13. And he was really the, the grounding, you know, the, the, the guiding force and the grounding force in my life. And in, in many ways was my home as we traveled around the world. And so losing him so young, and then at the same time, also trying to make sense of the world around me that was often very chaotic because of the work that he did. You know, we lived in Ethiopia during a civil war. We had to be evacuated out when the war kind of moved into the capital. I was too young to really understand the forces at play around me, but there was this sense of sort of danger and and worry. Um, and that's, you know, how I began to think of um, my life as existing on fault lines and like I always had the sense that the fault lines were sort of private and personal, you know, like my own griefs, but then also connected in some ways to these larger forces that were playing out around me that I sometimes didn't always understand. But, you know, this is kind of low grade worry and fear that, you know, a bigger disaster was coming. And so I think that I didn't recognize that I was just walking around with that and carrying it everywhere I went. And so was always on kind of high alert. Um, and I think the process of writing the book and, and the reason that I actually started writing this book as a private project before I knew that it was going to be a book was to kind of process that grief and that fear and, you know, all of the things that I'd been through and try to kind of move myself to a place of deeper understanding and potentially, you know, deeper peace um, in terms of un knowing sort of how I got here and and opening up new possibilities for myself. So in that respect, is your, your private seismometer 
peaceful, relatively. Uh, I know the the outside world is still filling us with a lot of dread and trauma right now, but but you know, how's the seismometer? Yeah, I mean, I think it has been a really challenging year and a difficult year for for everyone, and so I think that you know, my seismometer has definitely been active in this last year, but I just have this deeper awareness of it. And so it's not sort of setting off alarms that I am not um, willing to hear or acknowledge, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's the big change is that I can, I can feel that happening in myself and say, okay, this is happening. I need to slow down. I need to take, you know, more time to process and rest and, um, you know, figure out what I can do, uh, what I can control and what I can't, you know, I'm just more aware of my feelings and emotions and um, sort of how I'm taking in the world around me. Okay. Now, how's your family's response to aftershocks been? Um, it's been good. You know, I, um, I, the, the book sort of leaves off in a place where I'm just coming to reconciliation with my mother, but it's been a, over a decade now. Um, and, you know, we do have a relationship that I think both of us are really proud of that we've both really worked hard on to come back together um, and be in relationship with each other. Um, and, you know, part of the process of writing the book, too, was um, for me to try and extend some compassion and understanding for the context in which she was making decisions, including the decision that she wasn't ready to be my mother. And so I did try to hold on to this principle when I was writing, when I did decide I was going to be writing a book, that I was writing toward love and connection. And that required me to not make anyone a villain in my story, you know, to, to try and make people, um, the people in my family, the people in my life, multidimensional and, you know, show the fullness of their humanity because I was really trying to kind of um, write myself closer to them and to, to deeper understanding. And so, you know, we've, we've done so much work. My mom has been a huge support of me writing the book. She's come to readings, even when I'm reading, you know, sections that might be difficult for her. <laughs> and now she's driving around Massachusetts, you know, taking photos of the book in, in bookstore windows. Um, and I think in some ways too, I've, I had published several of the chapters of the book before it came out. And that, opened up opportunities for me to talk to many of the people in my family about, you know, the events of our lives and have more honest discussions. And so, yeah, everyone has been, has been supportive and, you know, some relationships are more complicated than others, but, but it is still for me, like a project of trying to find my way back to people and to, um, you know, very actively choose to continue to be in relationship and to, and to love them. One of the issues I run into with with some memoir writers, or one of the things they run into and tell me about, is the either why did you write about me, or why didn't you write about me more? <laughs> did did you run into to any of those with with family members or friends that you were uh, you know capturing in the book? I haven't so far. No. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it depends on how uh, I guess scandalous one's life is uh, as far as that stuff goes. But, right, you know. I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was glad uh, that there was actually a coda to, to aftershocks in in Bon Appetit of all places. But you know, you have the, a a follow up story in a sense of of visiting your mother and yeah. reconnecting that way. I, I thought after finishing the book, I read that and thought that's. That's actually a neat way to to kind of extend what's going on in history without having to give too much away of of how the rest of your your lives together and your relationship have gone. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that was a fun one to write because it was also sort of you know it's Bon Appetit, so I was also writing about food, and so that was interesting to kind of draw from the memory of a meal and kind of connect that to this this bigger story. Mm. Now, near the end, you, you do quote your father as as saying. I believe in the power of remembrance. And to me, it struck me as, as you know, the, the, the motive force for Aftershocks as a project overall. But, you know, when, when it comes to rebuilding both your, your, your sense of his identity and how you sprang from that, do you feel that that's the sort of the key behind it? I know the idea of fault lines is obviously you know, the big motif within it, but that sense that remembrance trumps all. I hate using the word Trump, but <laughs> <laughs> I know it's such a complicated word these days. Um, 
but yeah, no, I think, I think that's right. Thank you for, for saying that and drawing that out. Um, and it really was, yeah, a process of sort of remembering and reconnecting and, you know, claiming and reclaiming and, um, reckoning with the past, which I think is something that all of us really should do a lot of, um, whether that's sort of the past in terms of our own lives, but also the past in terms of, you know, the countries and the context in which we live. And I think um, it made me feel really connected to my father. And I, I, you know, I wish that I could talk to him about it because of course I don't know, I was so young and I don't know exactly what he meant when he, when he said, some of the things that he said, or, you know, my memories of what he said. But um, as I was doing research, I was, you know, I, I knew this, but I came to know it in a deeper way, the ways in which the Ashanti people, the culture from which my father came from um, in Ghana, that, you know, the Ashanti really believe that the ancestors are always with us and that they're part of our day-to-day -day lives kind of interrupting us and influencing us and interfering with our decisions where they think we might be making the wrong ones and um, doling out you know justice where there needs to be justice if there are kind of disputes in the family or somebody has done wrong you know and that that really is kind of central to the way that Ashanti people even you know as most Ashanti people now are Christian but the old kind of belief system is still very much a part of, of people's lives in terms of kind of uh, connection to the ancestors. And I think that that is part of what my father was talking about. Like, I don't think that he literally believed that his ancestors were like showing up as, you know, ghosts or anything like that, but just the ways that history is always present and how history shapes us and how we can connect to the people that we've loved and lost through remembrance. I think that's what he was trying to say. Of course, I can't ask him, but um, it did make me feel much more connected, not only to him, but also to my culture um, that, that I have often felt somewhat disconnected from because I didn't grow up in Ghana. Um, and I don't speak the language and, you know, for all sorts of other reasons. Yeah, and I guess that's my my home question. When you use the term my culture, that, that's that's what I wonder, you know, about your identity and, and the well, as somebody who's part of the rootless cosmopolitan ethno religious group out there, um, you know, what it's like to to own, you know, one story to, to own a, a certain, you know, my culture, I guess, yeah, uh, to have that sense that you belong. Yeah, I, I do claim um, Ashanti culture as my culture, but I also claim Armenian culture as my culture. Yeah. And I also claim Italian culture as my culture. I lived there for 10 years, you know, and Tanzanian culture because I'm deeply connected to Tanzania. I was born there and grew up among Tanzanians because my stepmother was Tanzanian. So, you know, as I said, like, yes, I, I very strongly claim, you know, uh, my cultures and, and Ashanti cultures. I'm talking about it. But I also have these deep connections to so many other cultures. And in some way, that is a huge part of, of who I am as a person, sort of that acknowledgement that I am. I am a person made up of many cultures and many peoples, and they all sort of come together in me in different ways. But um, I choose to, to be connected to them and to claim them as mine, you know, acknowledging the complications of doing that. And you live in New York, which is the place people come for reinvention. <laughs> and the, the the place we build our own identities. So yeah, definitely. In that sense, you know, who are the the literary figures and influences? To me, those are the the ancestors who speak to me weirdly. Um, <laughs> just because I I <laughs> live a particularly deracinated life, uh, even though I've been in the same place fifty years, as I've said. Um, but the the literary voices who speak to you, yeah. So which I is a way of asking where did writing begin for you, also. Yeah, so I um I actually have really clear memories of my father um telling me stories going back to the Ashanti culture telling me stories mm -hmm. from the very ancient um Ashanti oral storytelling tradition including the Anansi the spider stories which some people might be aware of because they're mm -hmm. told in different forms in many places including on the islands of the Caribbean and so people say that they sort of survived the middle passage and came from you know, the, the Ashanti tribe and sort of made their way um, and were adapted in new worlds. And so I can really remember my father telling me those stories. And I think that was the, those are my kind of first clear memories of storytelling and sort of being delighted by storytelling. So I think that's a huge um, part of my um, 
my love of story and why I'm a writer. Um, but then as I got older, um, I, I remember sort of my father always had a lot of books um, in his office and on shelves. And I remember in particular um, discovering Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston and like really deeply connecting to that book. I think I was in middle school because for a lot of years, um, you know, I went from listening to these Anansi stories that are all about people who were familiar to me, looked like people in my family, to not reading a single book um, written by a Black person um, or an African person for many years. Um, and I loved, you know, I loved my English classes and I loved the books that I was, a lot of the books that I was reading, but there was something about that recognition and seeing, even though it was an African-American person, it was in a completely different um, time. But there was something about sort of um, seeing this Black woman, um, Janie Crawford, centered in this story and just like a, a fully realized, amazing, complicated, flawed um, woman that I really connected to. And so after that, um, you know, I asked my father for other recommendations and sort of discovered um, Toni Morrison and Audre Lorde and um, Tsitsi Dangaremba. And James Baldwin eventually, you know, found my way to James Baldwin, who's a huge influence on me. Um, but yeah, I, I really, uh, uh, Chinua Achebe connected to a lot of sort of Black and African writers who sort of gave me permission to dream that I could also be a writer. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you remember a, a moment like that where you thought this is what you actually want to do? I don't remember not thinking it's what I okay. want to do. <laughs> yeah. So I don't remember a specific moment. You know, some of my earliest memories are of like writing what I called novels, you know, on plain white paper that I would staple together and give to my father for, for feedback. So yeah, as long as I can remember. Yeah. I used to do the same thing. I just managed to sabotage my th myself through anxiety and everything else to end up becoming a, a podcaster instead but uh, again neither here nor there um although right we, you, we yeah, it, it, it's pretty frightening how how far you know one can can really just straightjacket oneself with this stuff but um although it is actually a topic that we had a brief twitter exchange about uh in terms of imposter syndrome and what it takes to get over that and whether you actually have or haven't because i can tell you some stories um but do, do, yeah. do you feel like you you, you're, well, an imposter in, in what you do? Yeah, often. Or I mean, I don't think that that's, I, I've come to the conclusion that that's probably always going to be there. Um, and I think in some ways with uh, publishing Aftershocks, I'm kind of lucky because um, it was something that I wasn't writing for anyone else. I really was writing it for myself. And I think in some ways that set me free from a lot of that thinking. And through the writing of it, and then through eventually being able to publish it, you know, it has, it has moved me into believing that I can continue to write and hopefully publish, but, you know, it's a day-to-day -day struggle. It, it's, it's, you know, there are days when I look at what I'm working on and I'm like, this is crazy. Why do I keep doing this? I don't know how to do this. Um, I'm a complete imposter and nobody is going to read or care about anything that I have to say. And then there are days where I just am really following my own curiosity. And those are the best days because it's, it's not so much about thinking about other people, but it's more about sort of connecting to things that I deeply want to know and understand. And then, you know, I think from that, then I can hope that other people might be curious about the same things and that readers might find their way to it. But no, I haven't, you know, I haven't gotten over it, I wouldn't say. Um, it's just something I kind of try to work through. Okay. My advice is uh, to understand everybody else is a fraud too. And <laughs> you're never going to get caught because they're all afraid they'll get caught next. This, tr <laughs> trust me. And, and I discovered this as a lobbyist down in Washington. Uh, I, I say in New Jersey, but I do some lobbying down, down there for my day job. Um, and I had a climactic moment where I realized, oh my God, nobody else is qualified to do this either. I thought it was just me. And <laughs> and from from then on, I've, I've been liberated in terms of understanding that, uh, yeah, the reason nobody gets busted is because they're all afraid they'll be next. Um, again, if you take any wisdom from this conversation, that, that's my one thing that I have to offer, I guess. <laughs> but uh, I was wondering when you talked about the, you know, following your curiosity and pursuing those, those not the the personal story, but the the broader context of the world. How much does your background, the the masters you you pursued in urban planning and that that field of work, 
integrate itself or, or you know, how much is it reflected in, in what you do in your own, quote unquote, your own writing? Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways, like both going into the field of urban planning and policy and being a and going into sort of my creative life and work are connected to like very similar questions. So, um, you know, when I think about cities, I'm asking kind of how people interact with each other and with place and who places serve and why and, you know, what allows people to feel a sense of security and of belonging and, you know, as, as I said, I'm also increasingly thinking, like, what is the history of why this city is built the way that it is, of why people live where they live and um, the beliefs that they hold? And how can we learn from that history? You know, what ideologies and philosophies are baked into the systems that exist now? And what might we do to undo them to make them fairer and more inclusive? Um, and I think a lot about um, decolonizing places, you know, and through my writing, um, I'm, I'm asking very similar questions. You know, I'm asking them in different ways than I am through, the, through my policy work, but they definitely do inform each other. Um, and, and, you know, with aftershocks in particular, like those questions of home and belonging and identity and, you know, uh, the background of conflicts that then shape people's lives and private moments. Like those are things that, that I'm just as interested in, in my creative life. And so, you know, one it definitely informs the other and I move back and forth pretty fluidly between, between those two practices. Hmm. And from the bio on your, your site, actually, no, it's from your Twitter feed. You, you just started a new role in the last week or so. Uh, an, a new day job side thing. Is that something you're able to talk about or is it something you kind of want to oh, no, separate no. from Aftershocks, Nadia? Sure. No, I can talk about it. So I I have worked for nine years, um, for nine really incredible years in which I've learned so much um, for an organization called Living Cities that um, works to address poverty and inequality, um, particularly around um, closing racial income and wealth gaps in U.S. cities. Um, and, you know, I, I was there for a long time and did a lot of really amazing work that I'm proud of. And, you know, as I was kind of going through this year that I think has been kind of a year of reckoning for so many of us and began to think about, okay, I've learned so much, but what else is out there for me to do? And, um, you know, are there spaces that I can experiment with some of the things that I've learned in different ways? Um, and so I, I decided to leave that job and I am now just in the process of joining um, Frontline Solutions, which is a black owned consulting firm that supports many social change organizations um, in figuring out how to have greater impact in the world. And so that's really exciting to me, particularly because my role there specifically is focused on storytelling. So what are what are you know the consultants learning from working with the different social change organizations and how do we tell those stories of change in ways that are helpful to other people who are kind of dealing wrestling with the same questions and so um it, it I'm very excited it's it's brand new um but but yeah that's what I'm going to be doing for my day job and is he director of storytelling by the way is an awesome title i'm i'm stuck with president slash founder and that's kind of banal and, and all. I, <laughs> I i much prefer something that has a narrative quality like that so yeah, it's yeah. Fun. Uh, the um protests last summer uh for for blm you know were you well i, I never like putting people on the spot because people have various reasons if they weren't able to to engage in protests partly because of the pandemic but were you part of of what was going on? Did you get out in March? I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I was out quite a bit, um, actually. Um, and it felt really important to me, particularly, you know, of course, there are risks associated with the yeah. pandemic, but it felt really important to me because those forces and, and, you know, I work again in the social justice space with a lot of organizers who, you know, were organizing some of these protests and kind of, um, uh, felt like I really needed to show up um, for for the community that I live in. I live in Bedside, Brooklyn, um, you know, and a lot of um, Black and Native um, people in particular w were being impacted not just by the violence that that we were seeing and protesting, but also on top of that by like far higher rates of 
um, d death from, from COVID, which is, again, connecting to history, like the legacy of 400 years of oppression. Um, and so it felt really important to me in this moment to continue to push myself to work for justice in, in, in as many ways as I could, whether that's as a writer, whether that's out in the street, whether that's, you know, in my day job. Um, and, and I think especially, you know, connecting to this question around home, I think making home in some ways is a very active thing. And bed -Side Brooklyn is a home. And in order for it to continue to feel like home, I have to continue to show up and connect with my neighbors and the people around me. And, you know, these issues are really important to the community that I live in. Um, and so that that felt very urgent to me to be out there. Yeah, I just, you know, I, I always have the caveat of it was a pandemic. You might have health issues I don't know about. You know, some people have had to, to you know, send support but not actually be out there. In fact, that, well, it raises a question that might put you on the spot, but it's something I asked a lot of past guests for a recent episode. Is there something you wish you had done before the pandemic? And and that can have a wide range of meanings, either skill you wish you developed or place you wish you had gone or something else, just things you look at now and, and think, wow, you know, I really wish I had X before everything yeah, that's began. That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I actually, I lost my, both of my maternal grandparents to uh, COVID kind of early oh. in the pandemic in the spring. And I had gone to visit them um, very briefly um, over kind of our, the Christmas break. So the last time I saw them was, was right uh, after Christmas. And, um, and so I, I do feel like I did get to see them and, and spend time with them. But if, if I sort of knew then what I know now, I would have gone again, you know, I would have gone before the pandemic, um, to spend more quality time with them and probably with my other family members in Massachusetts, cause they're, you know, relatively close, but usually you're like, okay, I'll go with Thanksgiving and, um, so you go months without seeing them. And particularly for me, because there were years in which we were um, separated by, you know, oceans and estrangements. And, you know, my grandparents were always really loving and would always sort of send me packages and reach out to me, even when, you know, I wasn't speaking to my mother. And, you know, so in some ways, I was sort of making up for lost time when they were um, kind of getting, getting up in, in, in years. And so that's, that's what I would say, I guess I would have, I would have gone back to see them one more time. And has the, the lack of travel been the toughest part for you of this past year, or there's something else, you know, outside of that, just, you know, what is it, um, for some people, it's just restaurants or just going to bookstores or something, but you know, what's been, uh, your, your pandemic. Yeah, I mean, travel has definitely been difficult because the lack of travel because my family live all over the world, you know, and so um, it's not my aunt, for example, my my aunt, who I'm very close to, who kind of raised my sister and I for a few years after my parents got divorced. Um, so she lives in the UK and, you know, she had to have a surgery in the midst of the pandemic. So it was really hard to not be able to go and be with her she's okay. And, you know, we got, we we're very fortunate. She was well taken care of. She's a nurse and her surgery um, took or retired recently, but her surgery took place in the hospital where she worked and she was really well taken care of, but just not being able to travel and be with her. And then my nephew in Ghana, my brother lives in Ghana and he's just growing up, you know, he's two now. And, you know, so usually, you know, I would have been able to kind of go to either the UK or to Ghana to see family at some point. Um, which, you know, we don't know when that's going to happen. So that has been difficult. And then I'll also say um, my now husband, um, we've been together for five years. He's a musician. And so that has oh. been really hard too. He's a jazz musician, um, hasn't been able to play um, gigs really, except for, you know, in the summer, he had a couple of outdoor concerts that he played, but that's been really, that's been really tough. Live music is such a big part of our life and, the way that we connect with our community and friends. And so that has really been difficult, particularly living in New York and New York is a city of so much art. And like, yeah. that hasn't really been much of that this year. Yeah. That's been the, I'm 25 miles in the city, but that's always been the, 
the, the the sheer concentration of it all and and the ability to just go and do something and you know to know that that's anytime i leave my town i see the entire new york skyline over this this mountain quote unquote mountain here and it's just i don't know i have no idea when i'll be back in there you know when yeah. we'll be able to just you know sit down as we should be doing sitting down at a table and having a face to face conversation instead of this oh, speaking of by the way have you um how long did it take you to figure out your best zoom angle <laughs> that's a great question and i'm not gonna lie i have given that some thought i mean the angle not as much but um the lighting the, the, the setup lighting. the shelves behind you yeah <laughs> and also i realized kind of early on that you know my computer was flat on my desk which meant that i was sort of looking down at it so i now have like a stand um but i've been doing so many you know especially with the book coming out in this um in this environment where everything's online. So I've been doing so many Zoom events um, for book tour and that sort of thing. And and before that, even just, you know, um, kind of pre, um, pre book release event. Yeah. And so I have spent some time thinking about, okay, what's the right backdrop? Should I turn it so you can see my bookshelves? Like what? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I did a, a Today Show segment um, th that presumably will never air because it was literally half an hour before the insurrection. Oh, wow. um, we, we finished at 1230 on January 6th. It's, uh, I, my day job is pharmaceutical manufacturing related stuff. And um, they only pitched it the day before. And I literally turned the desk 90 degrees, rearranged all the bookshelves behind me. So <laughs> instead of a big empty room, it would be taking a shot of bookshelves and they'd be filled with books by my guests. So I, I just like littered everything in case anybody ever looks in the background, they'll see all this. But, you know, again, I have a feeling um, it's been three weeks now, four weeks. So I have a feeling we'll, we'll never see that segment, which is probably for the best. But um, the other question, uh, which I didn't think I was going to ask, because uh, I, I, I know it's a curse to ask people about their next project when they're talking about the, the current one that's just come out. But you did mention a novel. Um, is that something you you're thinking of in future? Or did the novel sort of, or was it a veiled version of Aftershocks that you ultimately realize would be better served by a memoir? What are you working on next is the, the real question. Yeah. I'm, so I am working on a novel now. Um, it's not the same novel that I was working on before Aftershocks. Um, it's a completely different story. Um, and it's early days, but I'm, I'm having fun with it. Um, and I think, you know, especially now having sort of a creative project to, um, to take a lot of my attention, um, has been really great. Um, uh, rather than sort of, um, refreshing the news, you know, a lot of those, uh, those weeks and days where it felt like that's all anyone was doing. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm working on a novel. Um, and then also at the same time, thinking a lot about, um, different essays that I want to write, um, following, you know, questions that I'm carrying right now and thinking about, um, so sort of have two projects going and we'll see, um, we'll see sort of which one picks up speed first. Um, but both very kind of early, early explorations. I look forward to it. it. It's one of the the lessons I got early on from some veteran writers, which was don't ask that question, Gil, you're just going to jinx it. So, you know, don't don't feel like you should ever respond to something like that too, too in depth, because apparently you'll you'll be cursed. Um, last question. The, the book centers around the, the, the major depressive episode you had and and how you spent a week basically sitting in the blue chair. Um, what happened to the chair? Did you keep it? I didn't. I did keep it for a few years. Um, but when I moved out of the apartment where I was living in Chinatown, I did decide that it was time for me and the chair to separate as well and to, you know, sort of get a fresh start. And I actually got um, a lot of my furniture back then was sort of uh, borrowed found. or found or, you know, <laughs> given to me by someone who didn't want it anymore. And so when I moved um, out of my Chinatown apartment, I sort of decided to allow myself to choose some things that I was going to bring into this new home. And so that's that's sort of when I set it out on the street and maybe somebody else picked it up. It, it was still in pretty good shape, but um, it served me well, but it was time for us to move on. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> hey, you, you didn't put a note on it explaining some of the history or anything, right? I didn't. It is, <laughs> it is New York. Everybody would just assume whatever they find out there has got you know a story behind yeah. it. 
Yeah. <laughs> Understand. Oh, I forgot the real last question. What are you reading? Oh, that's a great question. I'm currently reading um, Detransition Baby. Um, just starting uh, that by Tori Peters. It's a novel. I'm very excited about that. Um, and I just finished reading The Prophets by Robert Jones Jr., which I really loved as well. I don't know either of those, and now I'm going to go look them up. Awesome. <laughs> Nadia, thanks so much for, for coming on. I enjoyed Aftershocks, and, and you you brought a very different sense of, of memoir and identity than I'm accustomed to with, with that book. So, you know, that I think is a great job and really appreciate everything you, you kind of put together in this conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. And that was Nadia Owusu. Go check out her debut memoir, Aftershocks, from Simon & Schuster. It's a, well, it's a thoughtful exploration of the, the stories we tell ourselves and, and the ones that the world teaches us. They can check out Nadia at her site, which is NadiaOwusu.com, and on Twitter at NadiaOwusu1, and on Instagram at Where's Nadia. Her name is spelled N-A-D-I-A-O-W-U-S-U, but... This will all be in the show and episode notes for this one, so don't worry about writing it down. Oh, and thank you to longtime listener Garrett Zecker for connecting me and Nadia. Now, this is the point in the podcast where, once upon a time, I would ask you for support through the show's Patreon or PayPal. Um, as I've said ad nauseum, um, my job is treating me just fine. I've... I, taken care of. My expenses for the podcast are minimal. I don't want your financial support. What I would like is the occasional postcard, email, letter, whatever, telling me what you like or don't like about the podcast, uh, who you'd want me to, to record with, or just just your idle thoughts. Um, that sort of stuff goes a long way. And there are a couple of listeners who actually do drop me a line periodically, which is always nice. Um, but what I would like you to do, if you do have money to spare, like I say, don't give it to me. Give it to individuals in need. There are GoFundMes, Patreons, Kickstarters, Indiegogos. There are institutions and foundations in need, uh, food banks, the Poor People's Campaign, Freedom Funds. There are a lot of different ways that you can help. So this world needs a, uh, a lot of work, and um, I hope you can help fix it. Now, I am pretty close to finishing the second issue of Haiku for Business Travelers, my zine. Uh, I still have some copies left of the first issue. It's free. If you want one, just drop me a line. I will mail it to you. Uh, you can visit haikuforbusinesstravelers.com. There's a form there you can fill out, but nobody ever does that. Um, but like I say, it's free. If you want to kick in a few bucks for postage and production, you can, but this is not a, a money-making thing. It's just me sharing my art, such as it is. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 